Animal communication can take many, many forms. As you can see here, here's a sweet little pooch communicating to the person holding the camera, wagging his tail, ears are very high, uh, eyes are wide open. This, this puppy wants some pets. Um, so there's all kinds of things that can come through with animal communication. Um, animals can, of course, communicate to each other. So here's one dog clearly showing a submissive behavior to one that's showing a very aggressive behavior. Um, the other thing is that, of course, animal communication can be relatively complex in surprising ways. For instance, in honeybees, we know that they have this dance language that they do, where they communicate the position of nectar sources relative to the position of the sun. That's relative to their colony, so that they can communicate where they can go find nectar sources to more successfully find additional resources that are needed to provide for the colony's needs. Now, when we talk about vocalization, um, that's where it turns out that there aren't too many animal models that actually learn their vocalizations. Of course, we know that dogs can vocalize and they can learn the vocalizations of human beings to a limited degree, but surprisingly complex ways, but they don't actually learn their own vocalizations. And there aren't too many animal models that do this. So of course, we know that humans learn their vocalizations. We also know that the, um, there are some animal models that do as well. So bats can learn their vocalizations to a certain degree. Whales and dolphins can learn their vocalizations. And then there are three groups of birds, songbirds, parrots, and hummingbirds that learn their vocalizations. Now, uh, there's all kinds of interesting work in bats on learned vocalizations and really interesting work on the underlying neurophysiology, including here at Virginia Tech. Uh, there's a new lab here that's just starting their research on uh, how the auditory system processes vocalizations in bats. Uh, ba whales and dolphins, again, more interesting work, but those are much harder to keep in the lab. Now, songbirds are an excellent animal. There's full, over 4,500 different species of songbirds. They vary in all kinds of ways. Ones that are used in the lab are typically those that are relatively easy to keep. And the example of that is the Australian zebra finch. So this is the range of the zebra finch. And if you know anything about Australia, you know that the interior of Australia is quite harsh and not so hospitable to easy living. Quite dry, quite um, hot in many areas. And the zebra finch has a lifestyle that makes it suited for living in those areas. And these sort of adaptations that the zebra finch, finch has adopted makes them ideal for studying the lab. So they are opportunistic breeders. You give them food and water, they will breed. And they will breed relatively quickly. They reach sexual maturity very fast after about 90 days post-hatch. And so you can keep breeding them pretty quickly as uh, compared to most songbird species that take at least one year in order to you know, have subsequent breedings. They're highly sexually dimorphic. So this is the male here, and this is the female. They are domesticated. So we have varieties that have been widely domesticated and used in um, you know, uh, facilities all over the world. This is also true that they are now widely used for research and there are dozens of labs all across the world using zebra finches as their animal model to understanding vocal imitation and learning in songbirds. This is what one way of illustrating what a zebra finch song looks like. So this is what's known as a sonogram. So what we have here on the x-axis is time and on the y-axis is frequency. And the darkness of the marks is the amplitude. And so this is what a typical song looks like. You can see that there's a series of introductory notes, and then they have these repeated motifs that they sing over and over again with individual notes, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E. And so they repeat this over and over again. So this is a highly stereotyped behavior, makes it really easy to study and quantify. And they also learn these vocalizations. So that is the motif. So birdsong has very interesting parallels with speech, but it's not actually language. So both humans and birds, this is a picture of a, a little baby bird learning from its father. They acquire a vocal repertoire by imitation of sounds. But after that, things start to get different. So of course, with human vocalizations, there's symbolic representation and syntax. So we can arrange the phonemes in a certain way. 
Um, and that means that by arranging those phonemes in a certain way, we can create an infinite meaning with a finite repertoire. So and within human beings, there's around 45 some different phonemes that an, an individual could potentially produce. And any one language is going to have around 25 to maybe 30 phonemes in it. You can combine that in so many different ways to create thousands and thousands of different words with different meanings. With birds, there is syntax, right? The order of the notes are important. It's got to be sung as A, B, C, D, E, um, and they're going to sing it that way every time, but that's not really grammar per se. So there's not really representation of those notes. It's just a reflection of a vocal signal. And that's because a song is primarily used for courtship, attracting females, and for territorial behavior. So song learning varies enormously across different species. So in sparrows, we have you know, so we're showing hatch right here, and then there's a sensory period in each of these species when the bird learns its vocalization, primarily from the father. And then eventually that sensory period will end, and then there can be um, a sensory motor phase where the bird practices the song, and eventually it sort of makes a better and better song until it, when it's what we call crystallized, which means that the bird is now st has a nice stable song and it's not really going to change any time after that. And in many, many songbird species, it usually takes about a year for it to crystallize. And as we said, in zebra finches, they're precocious, they are opportunistic breeders, and they reach sexual maturity much faster. So they only take about 90 days to reach crystallization. So you can see why zebra finches are an ideal animal model for studying the development and learning of vocal, of vocal learning. There are other birds, such as canaries, which actually have our open-ended learners. So we have some, these guys are closed-ended learners. They do not learn new songs past their critical period. But the open-ended learners do. So canaries, uh, birds like mockingbirds, uh, starlings are open-ended learners. They can learn new songs as, an, as a sexually mature adult. And you can see that they will go through phases in which they have a sensory motor phase that will be open and maybe a new sensory phase and then the song will crystallize during the breeding season, and then it may become plastic again, and it can go over and over and over through the years. We know less about the underlying neurobiology of this process. It's been best studied in zebra finches. So some interesting things about songbirds and song repertoires, that some birds have a large, have a vary in their size of repertoires. Song sparrows are an example of this. So they can have as few as like four or even fewer songs in their repertoire, and then some birds can have as many as 12 songs in their repertoire. And here you can see data showing lifetime reproductive success, so how many like successful babies that they were able to raise relative to their repertoire size. And you can see that there's a distinct correlation with a larger repertoire size comes greater lifetime reproductive success, which means that this is a sexually selected trait it's consistent with the idea that larger repertoire sizes, at least in this species, serve as an honest signal that this is a good, reliable mate. Now let's get into the underlying neurobiology. So we refer to cortex as pallium. Um, that is a term that is used even in um, mammalian uh, brains. But we, we use this term specifically within um, non-mammalian brains to describe the areas that are similar to the cerebral cortex. Now, bird brains are small relative to humans. So this is a picture of a songbird brain, and this is a picture of a human brain, but, and then this is that same songbird brain relative to the human brain. You can see that it's very, very big, uh, the human brain relative to the songbird brain. But in general, they have very similar overall structure, right? There's a cerebellum in the back, there's this large overhanging area here, which is known as pallium, and that is similar to the cerebral cortex in mammals. So green is pallial, and then we have these other areas of the brain known as striatal circuits and palatal circuits. So striatum and pallidum are critical components of the basal ganglia. They're very important for procedural learning, and they're very important for song learning and songbirds. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the song control system and how much we know about the underlying circuitry. I'm not going to go through this in extraordinary detail, but one thing that's very cool about this system is that we basically have the entire system mapped out from the hair cells in the cochlea, so that's in the ear, 
all the way through auditory brain stem nuclei to midbrain nuclei up into auditory forebrain areas that are critical for the perception of song. And these areas become more and more specialized and they become more and more selective for bird song, some of these areas. Eventually they feed into a nucleus known as HVC, which is sensitive to auditory input, specifically a bird's song and specifically a conspecific song, especially in zebra finches. So they will be responsive to the songs of other zebra finches and not other birds. From there, we have the vocal pathways. So uh, this is a complex circuit showing the vocal pathways leading from HVC. Um, there are projections from HVC into area X, which goes to DLM, which is a thalamic nucleus, up to this pallial circuit, so a cortical-like circuit known as L-man, which projects to RA. Um, from RA, this is a motor circuit which projects down to a series of midbrain and hindbrain circuits that synapse onto the muscles that control the respiration, so controlling the lungs, as well as uh, motor neurons that synapse onto the muscles that control the syrinx in songbirds. So this is the vocal pathway. And we basically have circuits working out all of these inputs. Now this is a more simplified version of the song control system with focus on the vocal pathways. So in green is the descending motor pathway. So this is from HVC to RA, which is essentially like a motor nucleus, which synapses onto these uh, motor neurons known as the tracheosyringeal portion of the 12th nucleus. And they synapse onto the muscles of the syrinx, which is the vocal organ in songbirds. And in red is the anterior forebrain pathway. This is a cortical basal ganglia that's what these nuclei are, thalamo cortical circuit. So basal ganglia is located here in area X. It receives dopaminergic input into area X, and it is critical for overall song learning and song function. If you lesion these nuclei during development, a bird cannot learn. But if you lesion it once it has learned the song, there is some change that will occur over time, but that change is relatively minimal. Whereas if you lesion these motor and premotor areas during either development or once a bird has learned its song, it will no longer be able to perform song as an adult. So these are very, very important nuclei that are critical for producing the song, whereas this is a, a, a circuit that's critical for learning song. And it's a procedural learning circuit known as the basal ganglia circuit that is similar to the same circuit in humans. And so I had a conversation about FOXP2 and its control of song learning. And that's what we're going to watch right now. So you the know, only two things that I heard mm -hmm. being brought up towards the end there were abiogenesis and yep. the second law of thermodynamics. That's right. Yeah. And okay, I'll be honest. I was reading something when he was talking about second law of thermodynamics. Do you want to add in something? Because there's your comment there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I find that in fact about gravity interesting. Like he was just mm -hmm. sounded like he was just talking about um, like examples of things that like w didn't obey the second law. So I brought up gravity as an example there. Just okay. because it's one of my favorites. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but one of my favorite mm -hmm. physicists, uh, Leonard Susskind. Mm -hmm. um, I know Leonard Susskind. So he's brought this up in one of his lectures. That's where I learned about this, which I always find a, a, a super interesting fact that gravity doesn't really obey um, like the second law. It, it, it doesn't really have a very strong interaction with like, like with entropy or like sure. um, always fueling the increase in entropy. And the example right. that Leonard Susskind brings up um, is like, basically if you had like a frozen star, right? So it's no longer doing um, nuclear fusion. Mm -hmm. It's not um, expending any energy. It, it's like frozen. But if you introduced like a, a planetary object to that, it could form like the gravity could would form into a stable orbit, um, mm -hmm. which would decrease the overall entropy of the system without any en energy expenditure. Sure. So there's an example right there of the second law apparently being violated because you have this closed system of these two celestial objects. There's no change in the total en energy of the system. There's no like transfer of energy from one object to the other but the total entropy has gone down. Right. So that was an example that Leonard Susskind brought up that I just find very interesting. Like, yeah, yeah. Experiment. 
I hadn't um, considered that. And it, you know, in some ways it, it makes sense. Gravity is such, is this really mysterious force in many ways in that it, it, it doesn't necessarily involve energy transfer, but it obviously involves substantial effects on energy. Yes. And yeah. Right. And entropy. Uh, yes. And entropy. Yeah. I think it's a little bit of like a side issue because mm -hmm. most of the time, like the whole like evolution violates a second law claim can be shot down quite easily. Pretty easily. By just yeah. like the earth is it's not, a, not a closed system. system. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like the second law only applies to closed systems, which yeah. somehow that message has not gotten through to the majority of creation that bring yes. up the argument. They still bring it up. A lot of, if you read, if you ever bother to read like uh, bad arguments that creationists shouldn't make, that will, will often be on that list. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that other creationists make, right? Like, yeah. Well, the, I've also actually, funnily enough, I've had this argument actually the most intense with not a creationist, but like someone, I don't think they claim to be an atheist, but they are, are always in the comments and the live streams mm -hmm. arguing with the creationists. Mm -hmm. And they're saying like, no, you idiot. Like the second law only applies to the universe. And you can't mm -hmm. use the second law to talk about any system that's not the total universe. And he claims okay. to be a physicist in making these claims. So in order in that that's conversation, right. <laughs> that's actually what caused me to do the most research uh -huh. into the whole relationship between the second law and evolution, because I had to show him actual papers from biologists and, and from physicists, most pointedly, describing the the second law and like the changes in entropy for biological systems. So like just showing that you can calculate the entropy for any system it, yeah. open or closed. That's right. Yeah, has a calculable course. entropy level and a change in entropy. Right. Um, and so I found a very interesting article that was actually calculating the, um, the change in entropy uh, as a result of, of biological processes per kilogram of human like, tissue mm. and they were calculating that it actually changes over time so the entropy change as you get older is actually less as a result of your me metabolism than when you're like an infant or a child actually have has the most drastic increase in entropy per in entropy. program sure which is I mean, that makes sense too fascinating right? kind of results and and that's the thing about the entropy as a concept can be applied in so many ways the one way that i know of it is um looking at the you know so as a closed system mm -hmm. it, it, to a certain respect uh vocalizations of songbirds so this is what i did my phd on yeah. where we were looking at how the brain circuits that regulate singing in songbirds um in my my particular lab we were interested in how there are seasonal changes that occur um in in the in the in these species right sometimes in the breeding like when they're in breeding season during the spring they're singing a lot this brain circuit that regulates singing in songbirds actually gets bigger and then in the fall it becomes smaller and we were looking at the hormones uh how they regulate this process like changes in testosterone and its metabolites now they the main thing is like birds learn to sing that's a cool thing about songbirds so they use this circuit to actually learn their songs and you can measure the entropy of an individual bird's uh song repertoire um by just measuring the actual attributes of the song and so as a bird it starts to learn its song it tends to be quite variable and we refer to that as plastic song its entropy is actually really really high mm. um it has enormously high entropy and then as it gravitates towards like a specific song, it gets better and better every single time it sings that song. And so now like, uh, you know, the entropy on a given day, like a month later is going to be less. And we actually like we're measuring, we're literally like using measurements of entropy for that. Um, and it's within an individual bird. And of course, like you'll have a number that you could present for that bird and across multiple birds to create an average. And we can report like average entropy changes in a population as they learn their songs. So you're talking specifically about the behavior that they're producing, which is pretty wow. cool. Yeah. yeah, that's really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, right. So, uh, yeah, of Maybe course- Maybe you're the person to ask this, but um, mm -hmm. if, if you have some knowledge of songbirds, but mm -hmm. I had heard that one of the proteins that's involved in, in, in giving songbirds the ability to make their songs um, I think it's involved specifically with like their 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 tongue's ability to formulate the different like 
I guess syllables of the song or something. But I had heard that the protein, one of the proteins that it gives them capability to do this, was independently evolved in birds and in the human lineage, and that the, oh, the that I think humans have the same protein that we use to like for our tongues to get the ability to form words. So and, I think I know what you're talking about. Okay. So you might be talking about FOXP2. Is that right? I remembered it started with an F. So okay. that's a good sign. So I actually worked on this. I have a paper on FOXP2 and songbirds. Mm. Um, I can bring it up, actually. You're going to give me an opportunity to brag about <laughs> yeah. myself a cool. little bit. which is. Well, I, I heard that it was evolved independently in birds and humans, but so, in roughly the same protein. The birds do not have the same exact amino acid sequence as humans. That is not true. Um, they, they, um, it turns out that like humans, the human version of the FOXP2 has undergone some positive selection as, as best as we can tell. It's, it's a gene that does not vary an awful lot across mammals and across all vertebrates. It's a pretty important gene. It's really important for, for aspects of brain development, but other parts of our body too use FOXP2 as a re regulator. It's a, it's the a same, Sorry, just to make sure that this mm -hmm. is the same one that I was thinking of. Yeah, maybe. I remember that there was like a story of like a certain family, I think like in yeah. Pakistan no. that, or Afghanistan. Someone, uh, Scotland. Middle East. What? Scotland. Scotland? Okay, yeah. well, <laughs> I remember that there was a family that did not have this gene and like they are like technically able to speak, but like... Mm -hmm. They, they cannot, even though their vocal cords work and everything, because like their brains are there. There's like a disconnect between their brains being able to inform their tongue for how to form the words. Yes, that's essentially right. Let's talk a little bit about what FOXP2 is. FOXP2 is a transcription factor that is expressed in the striatum. It's not the only place where it's expressed, but it has really strong expression in the striatum. It is a member of the forkhead box family of transcription factors that regulate cell growth, proliferation, and differentiation. So let's back up here. A transcription factor modifies the change in gene expression of other genes, and it, the gene targets of FOXP2 are the ones that will allow for plasticity of neurons that are expressing FOXP2. The FOXP2 was originally identified in a family known as the KE family, which is in the UK. It is an autosomal dominant speech disorder that was discovered in this family. This is the citation to the study. And so these, the black marks are those uh, illustrating affected individuals. So being autosomal dominant means that if you have the gene, you have the expression of the, of the mutation. And it turns out that KE family had, a, had truncated FOXP2 and so they had a very specific speech and language disorder that leads to the uh, um, aphasia of speech. So they can understand speech, more or less normally, but their ability to produce speech is severely, severely inhibited. And there's videos on YouTube showing um, FOXP2 individuals. I encourage you to look it up. Let's talk a little bit about what FOXP2 does as a transcription factor. So. Of course, there's going to be promoter regions for various genes, such as FOXP2. So let's imagine that there are various promoters that allow for the expression of FOXP2. FOXP2 gets turned on, and it creates mRNA. So of course, FOXP2 mRNA goes up, which creates FOXP2 protein. Now with FOXP2 protein, what happens is that FOXP2 will then enact on the promoter for various genes to turn them on or turning them off. And then that will activate or deactivate those neuron, uh, those genes, allowing for plasticity of the neuron that is expressing FOXP2. How do we identify FOXP2 cells? Um, so one way of doing this is doing what we call immunohistochemistry. So if, a, if FOXP2 is turned on, the gene is turned on, the promoter's been turned on, there's going to be FOXP2 mRNA, and of course there's going to be FOXP2 protein. So there'll be lots of protein inside the cell. And there'll be antibodies that'll be specific against FOXP2 that we can use to label those cells that have FOXP2. And so this is a typical process by which we can uh, identify cells that are expressing FOXP2. And it is, it is a British family. It's known as the KE family that has a mutation in their FOXP2. Uh, it's a truncated version of FOXP2, 
So they were they, they have you know the ethnicity of this family. Maybe they're uh, uh, they I believe they're white in Scotland, but maybe I I'm just completely misunder misremembering that fact. No, I'm I'm pretty sure that they're they're white. I'm pretty sure that they're like English natives. Yeah, I don't and, know where I got Pakistani then. Well, I mean, there, there's another mutation in and that it might be. I'm not as familiar with like the underlying um, versions of because I know there are other at least mutants of Fox B2 that have emerged. Um, Simon Fisher is a professor at I think he's at Oxford. He might be someplace else, but he's the guy who's done the most work on this on Fox B2 and humans. Um, we were looking at this in Songbirds. Um, so yeah, look, there's me right there. So uh, this is a paper I published when I was in Germany. Um, so we were looking at FOXB2 immune reactivity in in um, in zebra finches. Uh, so I, I haven't looked at this paper in a long time. Um, but basically what we were showing, I, mean, I can skip ahead to here. So um, this is a cross section of the area of the brain that has high expression FOXB2. So this is FOXP2 immunohistochemistry. That's what this refers mm -hmm. to. That's what that is. So we did immunostaining for FOXP2. This is the basal ganglia of the um, mm -hmm. of the songbird brain. These are coronal sections. This is an adjacent section stained with crystal violet, which allows us to see like the cytoplasm of all the cells. Mm -hmm. So you can see like there's a lot of cells up here. These would be more. Uh, we refer to this as pallium, which is um, similar to the cortex in mammals. But the striatum is basically the striatum in both mammals and birds. Um, and it's loaded. You can see that, like, all right, there's a lot of cells here, but they don't really have a whole lot of FOXP2. But this area has a ton of FOXP2, right? And this, I don't know if you can see this, but there's this, like, lamb chop shaped thing here. This is an area of the song control system called area X. It's part of the striatum, which is critical for procedural memory. And it's necessary in order for birds to learn song. So PhD here, this is not that they graduated. This is post-hatch <laughs> day. So post-hatch day 35 and post-hatch day 50. So these were birds that were 35 days old and 50 days old. And what we were looking at here is just what does the immunostaining look like if we zoom in and look at, um, you know, uh, the numbers, like the cells that have FOXP2 in them. So when we look really, really close, so this is a really zoomed in version of, of like looking in. So basically we're getting closer and closer, right? So we this is zoomed out. This is this little box right here. This is the border of area X. Yeah. And so this is the inside and the outside. You can see that there's like tons of cells. And there's, when we look really, really closely, uh, we can see some cells that are really, really dark and then other cells that are light. So the arrow heads point to the light ones and then the arrows point to the dark ones. Um, this is true inside and outside of area X. It doesn't really seem to change much whether you look inside or out. So this is in juveniles, okay? So th what we're looking at here are not really the cells, but the nuclei. So FOXP2 is a transcription factor, and it affects the expression of all kinds of different genes. Now, when we look at adults, so these are now images taken from adults. One thing that we can see about FOXP2 is that it actually looks quite a bit different in mm -hmm. adults than it does in juveniles. So in adults, here in a bird that was singing, now we see instead of like us being able to, to circle um, area X, because there's so many dark cells in there. Instead, we see there are basically no dark cells at yeah. all. In fact, it's almost completely absent. Um, this is true, like there's very few dark cells even in non-singing birds. But one thing we do see in the non-singing birds is that there's still quite a few cells that are FOXP2 positive, but they're, they're less intense. So they're relatively weakly stained. There's only a handful of really intensely darkly stained cells. So basically, one thing we can see here is that there's a singing related. So these birds were singing for two hours and these birds were not. And these birds that were singing, there's a down regulation of FOXP2 that occurred. So FOXP2 decreased the amount of protein that was there in these cells so that there are fewer of them. Like, so this is inside versus outside. You can see that difference. Um, and, but if they don't sing, there's still some FOXP2 available. Basically this whole paper, and I can skip to the end because I have a nice little graphic that I made for it. Um, do so this whole paper can be described in this model here so basically what we we were able to show is that there's a lot of foxp2 positive cells inside area x and but there's a lot of them that are very intensely stained and what we showed in this paper is that the cells that are intensely stained for foxp2 are relatively young 
FOXP2 positive cells. So this circuit is developing and it's growing. And mm -hmm. there's a proliferative zone where these cells are born and then they migrate into area X. And during that time, some of those cells, well, I mean, while they're young, they're going to have an intense nucleus for FOXP2 amino reactivity because FOXP2 is a transcription factor that promotes dendritogenesis. It, it promotes the dendrites to grow and develop. Mm. And it also promotes like synaptic development. And so as they differentiate and turn into neurons, you're going to need a lot of FOXP2 so that they can grow and incorporate into neural circuits. Once they get into a neural circuit, you no longer necessarily have to have them uh, to have this really strong, intense FOXP2 immunostaining. But then we do see a singing-related regulation of FOXP2 uh, expression. So it, it's there a little bit to titrate some of the change that can occur at the synaptic level that we do know that, that singing can induce. And so that's how FOXP2 changes in these songbirds. Now, to relate this back to humans, basically humans have the same kind of expression. Okay, so they also will have a lot of FOXP2 expressed in the, the, the striatum neurons, which is also critical for procedural memories, including vocalization. So it turns out that these circuits are basically the same. They, we, uh, birds and, and humans have both have striatal circuits that are critical for learning procedural memories, such as vocal learning. It's just that these are, this is convergent evolution because obviously like it wasn't like a last common ancestor between birds and humans was also a vocal learner because then you would expect a lot more animals to be vocal learners. Uh, vocal learning is actually relatively rare in the animal kingdom and it's only derived a few times. And, you know, amongst mammals, I mean, it's only a handful of animals that actually have learned their vocalizations. So this family, they have a mutation in the, in the FOXP2 gene, the KE family, um, and they cannot, and actually I've got to talk, I might could come up with it, but they cannot, uh, they have uh, what's called aphasia. So they, they struggle with speech production and not so much the uh, cognitive understanding of language. So they can understand language pretty well, but the, the production of language is really, really compromised in these individuals. Okay, so what? So the convergent evolution between like bird lineages, like songbird lineages and human lineages, is not so much in like the like enzyme it's, itself. It's like because from what I understood from what you said, like the actual like enzyme family of FOXP two is shared um, between like pretty much all mammals and like bird ancestors would, would right. share the general enzyme class of like FOXP2, but right. um, the actual like function within vocal um, learning or vocal expression would be uh, like what was convergently evolved. Yes. Okay. Right. And, and then it's, it's ultimately we would be, it's, you would be shocked to learn how similar all vertebrate brains are. I mean, it's maybe, maybe not you personally. Um, you actually might not be all that shocked, but I think a lot of people would be, you think about brains being so complex that obviously like human brains got to be so much more complex than like a bird brain. And we refer to bird brains. Uh, like yeah, as a bird brain, <laughs> that's about to say. Right? Exactly. Right. But it's, that's not the case. You'd be surprised at how similar it is. So, so question then. Um, mm -hmm. So what you were showing with like the difference in the Fox P2 levels, uh, bef like mm -hmm. before, like a non singing and then like after two hours of singing, yeah. would there be a human equivalent to that? Like maybe like after Probably. two hours of like uh, a intense oration or something, mm -hmm. giving a presentation or having a debate or something. Right. Maybe after two hours of that, would, Potentially. would I be depleting my levels of FOXP2? So the thing is that um, not, not maybe. Um, actually, I take that back. I think so. Um, especially if it's uh, if it's something where um, uh, it involved dopamine which is something that's core to the way the striatum works yeah so you know what i'll a, just admit it i get dopamine while i'm debating <laughs> of course so, so do i it's part of the reason why i do it well us debate bros are kind of addicts actually so, <laughs> yeah right like i, I I'm, I'm doing this tonight because I, I need a hit like i was arguing with people in your you know in your video like come yeah. on debate me bro like come on come at me. yeah my dopaminergic system needs a hit exactly so th this is actually a slide I love to show. Um, so this is the zebra finch here. They're very cute little birds. 
And what they're doing here is they're measuring levels of dopamine in the area X. So this this mm. specific song system circuit. And actually, maybe I should go back to the song system. So this is a, a figure I made up illustrating the song control system. So it's a series of discrete brain nuclei that regulates singing behavior. So this is anterior. This is dorsal. This is the that pallium that I mentioned, which is basically yeah. like cortex. This is the cerebellum back here. This is the brain stem. Um, and of course, we have other structures here. So area X is part of this. It's a basically like a basal ganglia structure. Um, the neurons we were talking about that are FOXP2 positive, they're striatal like. They're medium spiny neurons. And this red circuit is known as the anterior forebrain pathway. And it's critical for the learning of song. And that when you mess this circuit up, when birds are learning, you completely mess up their ability to learn song. But if you mess it up once they're adults, there actually are very few changes that occur in the, in the singing production. Mm. But the descending motor pathway, like this is basically like pre-motor, this is like a motor-like cortex, air, cortical area. And then this, these are actual motor neurons that synapse on the muscles of the syrinx that produce the, um, the sounds in songbirds. Um, this is a very much like a motor pathway. And if you if you damage these brain areas, then the bird can no longer sing, whether they're adults or juveniles. So this is yellow pathway. This is the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra pars compacta. These are the dopaminergic areas of the brain that synapse into the striatal circuits here. So these are the dopamine neurons. Um, and, and like in, for Parkinson's patients, they will lose these dopamine neurons and then they can no longer like have a normal functioning basal ganglia and then they end up freezing. And then, and that's like one reason why Parkinson's occurs. So the amazing thing about this is like the circuit in mammals and in birds actually is very, very similar. The only difference is that in mammals, we have these two distinct areas of the basal ganglia called the striatum and the globus pallidus. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, like we knew that like there's this projection from HVC to area X and then to the thalamus. And we were like, okay, well, how can this really be the same as it is in mammals? Because they have two separate areas. It turns out in birds that basically they don't segregate these neurons from these neurons. They just mix them all up together in area X. And so they all get mixed up. Oh, so, yeah. So the other the cool thing about this is that like you need dopamine to, to regulate this and to drive this. So you can put a bird, uh, you know, in a cage where you can measure the amount of dopamine that's that's happening in their brains in real time. So that's basically what this is showing. So there's a bird in here. There's an outline. And then you can measure like the amount of dopamine that's being produced like on a basically a second by second basis. And then you can put a bird, you can put a female in front of the cage and then that bird will start to sing. And if he is singing towards a female, there'll be an increase in the amount of dopamine that's being released to uh, in area X while that bird is singing to the female. But if he's singing just by himself, so undirected song, there's a, there's not nearly as much of an increase. So this is another thing that we looked at in this paper where we found that there was a, a difference as well as in like how much FOXP2 changes, whether they're singing directed versus undirected. Huh. And that dopamine probably seems to be one of the key parts to driving that change in FOXP2 expression. Yeah, I guess if you have a visual on your potential reward, right? maybe that's going to... Well, uh, yeah, so the that's dopamine. the thing. About songbirds especially, they're singing not because like they're debating with their debate bros. They're they are laid. Yes, exactly. It's it's one of the four F's that they're most yeah. concerned with. So if well, you could like, you know, instead of just espousing your pickup lines to the mm -hmm. void, if you're if you've got a di direct visual on your target, That's you know, right. I could exactly. imagine that your dopamine systems are probably going to be elevated. Exactly. Wow. So, it's really interesting. Um, well, one of the one things last thing I'll say about the Fox B2. Um, the, so one thing that you can do is that you can do genetic manipulations of like how much Fox B2 is expressed using what's called short hairpin RNA. And how do we knock down Fox B2? So let's talk about using short hairpin RNA. So one thing that we can do is introduce a lentivirus that expresses a, um, a complementary sequence to Fox B2 mRNA. That complementary sequence will go around, it'll block the mRNAs of the FOXB2, and then those will degrade, which will mean there'll be no more FOXB2 protein. So we can effectively knock down FOXB2 expression by using this lentivirus manipulation. So let's take a look in the conversation I have with Grayson explaining this. So these are RNA constructs that will like interfere with um, the way this is produced. Um, so like you can inject the lentivirus 
into the brain that's that will express short hairpin RNA that'll block the production of these mRNAs so that you won't get any protein. And if you do this in a bird that is young, while the bird is learning their, their song, and if you inject these lentiviruses to knock down expression of the FOXP2, then they, they, they can still sing. So this is the short hairpin FOXP2, but this is similarity to the Tudor song. So like the song that they were supposed to copy, you can see that its similarity score is only 60%, whereas like the animals that were injected with a control virus, they have like a normal similarity score, which is about 90%. So interfering with FOXP2 expression specifically in area X, like during the phase when they would be learning, specifically blocks their ability to like learn song. So that was an experiment that someone else did. And so did, do, do we know if, if that was like mediated by like... Uh, like dopamine levels basically being impacted? This in particular, no. But the fact that dopamine plays such an important role in shaping the neural circuits of the basal ganglia, such as area X, uh, certainly is likely shaping the um, how much FOXP2 is being expressed. Yeah. And, and essentially like establishing which synapses are, should be preserved and which synapses should not. And that's the thing that is going to be the signal telling the brain, like, yes, you want to have this song uh, working and, and, and you want to match the song. So basically the way dopamine works is that when a bird is singing and if they're practicing the song and they sing it pretty well um, and they, they're matching the template of the tutor, that feels good. It's like, oh, I did a pretty good job. There'll be a little bit of dopamine that's released that will act on the synapses in the area X, preserving those synapses to say, you know what, you did a good job at that point, the, we should preserve those synapses. And then if they screw up, there's gonna be less dopamine that's released. And then mm. those synapses that fired to make that song, that's an error signal that'll say, you know what, maybe we don't want those synapses to be a part of the production of this song because you screwed up. So let's not do that. And that is the trial and error process that occurs for um, uh, for procedural memories. And that FOXP2 is likely one of those key genes that's involved in making sure neurons are, are plastic enough that they mm -hmm. can continue to add neuron, uh, add synapses or subtract synapses. Yeah, that concludes this discussion on FOXP2. I hope you enjoyed that discussion that I had with Grayson at Base Theory. You can check out a link to his YouTube channel down below. Uh, he's a super great guy, very interesting, very intelligent, super strong advocate for evolution. And yeah, um, if you like this content, please like and subscribe and we will check you later. Bye-bye.